Historians generally agree that copper was the first metal to be widely used by humans, and it's been known since antiquity that copper turns flames green. Around the 18th century, early chemists determined that green from copper in a flame turned blue if you paired it with a halogen of some sort, especially chlorine. It didn't take long until people started using copper to produce colored fireworks, and pyrotechnicians haven't stopped experimenting since that time. As I said, copper ions normally impart a green hue to flames, and there are some bizarre green compositions floating around that call for copper powder. I've never personally felt that they outperform barium salts for this task, and most of the industry seems to agree. Instead, we prefer to use copper salts with a source of chlorine to produce blue. Now, blue fire presents a bit of a conundrum in pyrotechnics because dark blue is almost always indicative of a relatively cool flame temperature. And to put it simply, fire is hot. It gets hotter when you start adding oxidizers to the mix, and it gets even hotter when you start adding metallic fuels like aluminum or magnesium. There's also something to be said for the flame envelope itself, because large flame envelopes tend to emit colors like red and orange on the perimeters where the electrons are less excited and the flame composition is different. For these reasons, the ideal blue star composition burns relatively cool, has plenty of copper and chlorine, and produces a small flame envelope. Easy enough, right? <laughs> Yeah, in practice it's not so simple, and a good blue star is a bit of a white whale for a lot of people, myself included. The perfect blue star is so elusive that seemingly every conceivable copper salt has been tried at one point or another. There are numerous forum posts and articles on the subject, with a good portion of them claiming to have cracked the code to a reliable deep blue. It's copper oxychloride. No wait, it's copper benzoate. You guys are overthinking it, it's actually just copper sulfate. Now spoiler alert, it's not copper sulfate, and it's never been copper sulfate. Also, look at this formula right here. Davis must have had a death wish. Absolutely do not make this formula. Jesus Christ. Back in the early days of pyrotechnics, people were more than willing to poison themselves in search of a good blue. I remember coming across this table in Weingart's book as a teenager and asking my dad if we had any Paris green laying around. Fortunately, we did not. Paris green is copper acetyl arsenite, as in a double salt of copper acetate and arsenic trioxide. It was used as a pigment by artists for many years, but it got its name from being used as a rat poison in the Paris sewers. Arsenic is crazy toxic, unless, according to Weingart, you are a Hungarian miner who has developed immunity and you eat realgar to ward off disease. I was very ready to call Weingart even crazier than Davis, but I did some research and, um, yeah, it turns out arsenic immunity might actually be a thing. You'll notice some of these formulas also call for calomel, aka mercurous chloride, which was used as a chlorine donor in the days before Parlon and PVC existed. Needless to say, mercurous chloride is also pretty toxic, but luckily Weingart warns us of the danger of mercury, uh, nope. Just the danger of Paris green. No mention of the mercury salt or barium nitrate being toxic, and he recommends a handkerchief as PPE. 1947 was absolutely wild. Paris green, calomel, and oddball toxic compounds are really not used that much in pyrotechnics anymore for good reason, and it's extremely rare to find Paris green these days. There was one pyro retailer that had some recently, but this picture on their site implied that they had come upon a 100-pound barrel from back in the day, and it's likely all gone now. Historically, the primary copper salts used in pyrotechnics were of course Paris green, but also copper carbonate, copper 2 oxide, aka cupric oxide, and occasionally copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is tricky because it's very hygroscopic, and like any sulfate, it's incompatible with chlorate, so generally it's not used too often anymore. Copper carbonate and cupric oxide are far and away the most prevalent compounds used in modern formulas, with the oxide having the majority of the market share on most platforms. In my experience, cupric oxide works pretty well, but you have to be careful in fuel selection because oxides can burn quite hot, and high temperatures will quickly wash out any blue color. Also, cupric oxide emits a tiny bit in the red spectrum, which can sometimes be seen at the edges of the flame. Generally, I would advise you not to waste your time trying blue formulas that call for cupric oxide and metallic fuels because they're always going to be washed out and closer to white than blue, but that's also just my opinion, man. That said, cupric oxide and metallic fuels can work when the goal is a color like teal or purple, and we've covered these combinations in previous videos. For pure blues, cupric oxide is best paired with organic fuels such as shellac, red gum, sulfur, or even lactose to help keep flame temperatures low. The requirement of a lower flame temperature is also a selling point for copper carbonate because, as we've discussed before, carbonates tend to lower flame temperatures in general. Theoretically, the coolest possible blue star formula would feature a low-temperature oxidizer, a carbohydrate fuel like lactose, and copper carbonate or some other low-temperature copper salt. In practice, however, there's a lot more to it than just keeping the flame temperature low. Which oxidizer to use also presents a bit of a conundrum, and the only real choices are potassium chlorate, potassium perchlorate, and ammonium perchlorate. A lot of modern formulas use ammonium perchlorate because it burns a bit cooler and also releases plenty of chlorine, which reduces the need for an additional chlorine donor. Potassium chlorate also releases chlorine as it decomposes, but potassium perchlorate doesn't always break down like that. Chlorine donors like Parlon, PVC, and Saran can burn a little hot and funky sometimes, which can interfere with the delicate balance necessary for a good blue star. 
As a result, the best blue stars often call for either chlorate or AP with minimal additional chlorine donors. If you watched the last two videos, then you may be wondering where copper nitrate fits into all of this, since barium and strontium nitrate are ideal for green and red respectively. The answer is that copper nitrate is hygroscopic bordering on deliquescent, and therefore is pretty useless in pyrotechnics. It is nice to look at, though. Now as I alluded to, I've been chasing a good blue like a junkie for about 15 years now. I've probably burned through a few kilos of various copper salts seeking perfection, and every time I get excited about a new composition, I end up being let down. To put it in artsy terms, I personally find that most blue stars lack any color depth. It often feels like they're burning and just happen to be a little blue as opposed to being very obviously blue. Last year I decided I was just going to bite the bullet and get some insight from an actual expert in the field. I reached out to u slash Moselium on Reddit, a veritable pyrotechnic chemist, and surprisingly he responded to this wall of text. The main questions I asked were as follows. A. Does the oxidation state of copper in various salts affect its blue potential? If this is Greek to you, the oxidation state refers to the number of electrons that a given molecule has. Metallic copper is in what's called a zero oxidation state, meaning it has all 29 electrons. If copper loses one electron in a reaction, it becomes copper plus one. If it loses two electrons, it becomes copper plus two. And now I know what you're thinking, why on earth do we say plus one and plus two if it's losing electrons? Well, that's because the oxidation state refers to the charge of an ion. Electrons are negatively charged, so if an ion loses an electron, then its charge becomes more positive, hence plus one. This is also why when an ion gains an electron, we say that it has been, quote, reduced, because it's a reduction in charge and not a reduction in electrons. Don't worry, none of this is on the test, and you don't need to understand this to make blue fireworks. I only ask this because I noticed that most of the copper salts we use in pyrotechnics feature copper in the plus two oxidation state, and basically I was just asking if there's a correlation there. The answer was essentially not really, and there are a lot of other factors at play that are far more important. Pause if you want to read his whole answers, because there is a lot of great science here. Okay, next question. If the color blue is best produced by the presence of copper and chloride ions in the flame, then how come copper 1 chloride CuCl is not the be all end all blue colorant? The answer was again, it's not that simple. It's about the production of copper radicals in the flame with an extra electron milling around. And okay, I'm getting a little over my own head here, so let's skip to question three. How come Paris green works so well, but plain copper acetate is trash? Is the arsenic doing something? And this is where things got really insightful. He talked about how arsenic emits a bit in the green spectrum and how the human eye is not a spectrophotometer, so true blue light in the 450 to 485 nanometer range is probably not all that nice to look at visually. The takeaway is that a touch of green in your blue might actually make it look more blue in person. We saw this to an extent with NT8's turquoise star in the last video on barium, and this concept may be the key to the coveted depth of color that I've been looking for. Let's rewind to the absolute madman Weingart's blue fire table. What have we here? Barium nitrate. What color does barium nitrate burn in the presence of calomel? Green. Maybe Weingart wasn't as crazy as he seemed. Now here we have my favorite green formula. Oxidized by ammonium perchlorate, no supplemental chlorine donor, cool burning organic fuel, pretty much all the ingredients for a theoretically great blue star, other than copper of course. So what if we alter this formula to reduce the barium nitrate a bit and add in some copper oxide instead so we get mostly blue but a little green, will it work? Yes it will work. The camera isn't really doing this justice, this is excellent in person. In my opinion, it's appreciably better than just AP, copper 2 oxide, and shellac alone. So if Weingart was onto this trick back in 1949, then why did it fall out of favor? The short answer is that I don't know. My theory is that most people who used Paris Green didn't realize what a difference the green from the arsenic was making, so when Paris Green became hard to find, they were looking to replace the copper source, but not looking to replace the arsenic. I guess the big message here is to try adding a little green to your blue formulas and see how it goes. If you come up with something great, then leave the formula in the comments, because I'd love to try it, and maybe even showcase it in a later video. All right, now it wouldn't be a pyrophoria video without a little chemistry, so let's talk about copper salts. I personally love doing copper chemistry because the colors are just so good, but remember that copper solutions are extremely prone to staining things like countertops, driveways, and even plastic or tile in some cases. Copper is not particularly toxic as metals go, but you certainly want to wear gloves and avoid ingesting or breathing any copper compounds. I'm just going to quickly blast through a few methods for making various copper salts at home, even a few exotic ones, but to avoid this video being an hour long, I won't go into a ton of detail, so please do additional research and be safe if you attempt any of these. We'll start with basic copper carbonate, which is easily made from a solution of copper sulfate or cupric chloride. Copper sulfate is widely available as root killer at hardware stores, and we'll talk about cupric chloride momentarily. To make basic copper carbonate, you just need to make any copper solution and then add baking soda or potassium carbonate. I'm using copper sulfate solution here, but again any soluble copper will work. The insoluble copper carbonate will precipitate as you add the baking soda, and this generates quite a lot of CO2 gas and can foam a bit, so certainly don't use a tapered flask or do this indoors. Filter it, wash it like crazy to get the sodium out, dry it, you're done. Next we'll make cupric chloride solution, which can be used in the previous reaction or turned into copper oxychloride. 
You just need cupric oxide and hydrochloric acid. Muriatic acid from the hardware store will work okay, but be aware that it's often not pure and has iron contamination, but that's no big deal for this use. Gloves and goggles are a must here, but once you've got them on, just work outside or in a fume hood and slowly add a little cupric oxide at a time to your HCl solution. You can also use copper carbonate for this step if you prefer, just be aware that the reaction is faster and more violent. It's pretty exothermic and this is producing hydrogen gas, so no smoking or open flames. It's tough to give exact amounts here because acid concentrations vary wildly, so just keep adding small amounts of cupric oxide, stirring, and waiting until you notice that it's no longer reacting and is starting to accumulate on the bottom. The solution does get very dark when it's close to saturated, so using a flashlight from the bottom is pretty ideal for seeing the undissolved oxide. Once it starts accumulating, just let the vessel sit for a few minutes to ensure it's unreacting. You can filter off the unreacted oxide if you want at this point. When it's clear that no more oxide is dissolving, just dilute your concentrate with distilled water until it's blue instead of green. Now this is a bit of a moment of truth. If you've successfully reacted all of the acid into cupric chloride, then you'll get a blue solution and a white precipitate. But if you have excess acid left, then you'll just have a blue solution. Obviously, I have some residual acid here. This is still okay, but if you get a white precipitate, then that is copper 1 chloride, and you can just filter it off before proceeding. Some older formulas call for it, just don't use it with chlorates. We can prove that I have excess acid by adding a pinch of baking soda. You can see that I get a lot of CO2 gas, but no copper carbonate precipitate like I would expect with pure CuCl2 solution. Don't do this with yours, or you'll introduce sodium contamination I'm just demonstrating here. You can do a few things with your cupric chloride solution, and the most obvious choice is to make copper oxychloride. Bring the solution to a boil with good stirring and add some more cupric oxide. After a few minutes of stirring, you'll see some turquoise precipitate, and this is your oxychloride. You can stop adding the oxide at any point, but I like to keep adding it a little at a time until it's clear that the reaction is no longer taking place and some oxide is building up. It is denser than the oxychloride and will sink to the bottom, so it's fairly easy to decant off the oxychloride and leave the oxide behind, but ultimately a little bit of oxide contamination is no big deal though because it's also a good blue colorant. Be sure to wash this very well if you intend to use it with chlorates because there is a fair amount of residual acidity. You can add baking soda to the cupric chloride solution just like you can with a sulfate, but again be aware that if there's any residual acid then there will be a violent neutralization before any copper carbonate starts precipitating. If you made oxychloride, then you'll notice that the waste solution is still blue from copper chloride because it won't all react, and this is still useful. Get yourself some household ammonia, the clear stuff is best, but a little soap isn't the worst thing, and start slowly adding the ammonia to the cupric chloride solution. You'll notice some really pretty dark blue as you add the ammonia, and we're actually going to keep adding it until the whole solution is that color. What we're making is a copper ammonium complex, sometimes called copper ammonium chloride, or any variation of those three words. Weingart mentions it in a few formulas from his book, and this stuff has a gorgeous flame test because it contains both copper and chlorine. You can evaporate it to get crystals for experimentation, or you can make party favors. Cut up some pieces of wood and drill some random holes in them. Doesn't really matter what kind of wood as long as it's not pressure treated. Soak the wood in the solution for a few days until it's saturated, and you may want to put a beaker of water or something on top to hold the wood under. Once it's saturated, take the wood out and let it dry for a few days in the sun or the garage, then throw these bad boys in the bonfire or your fireplace and bask in the ooze and ahs. Be sure to take all the credit, I do not mind. Alright, the last reaction is really straightforward. Let's say you want to experiment with copper benzoate, but it's out of stock or it's too expensive. Fret not. Get some potassium benzoate and dissolve it in water, and then pour that into any soluble copper solution. I'm using the sulfate here, but the chloride or nitrate would work fine as well. Copper benzoate will precipitate and you can wash and dry as usual. If you run these reactions at home, then you might end up with some copper waste solutions to deal with. The best way to handle them is just to add some aluminum foil, but this reaction can get vigorous, especially if there's some residual acid hanging around, so be careful. Put in a little at a time and let it react. A displacement reaction will occur, and metallic copper will precipitate as aluminum goes into solution. This is a reduction, and luckily you just learned what that means. Copper is gaining two electrons from the aluminum and turning back into metallic copper. Once it's not blue anymore and no aluminum is reacting, you can just filter out the copper and chuck the aluminum solution. It's not ideal to pour this down the drain, but it's much better for the environment than copper, and tons of aluminum already goes down the drain every day from people's deodorants, so it's not the end of the world. I find that copper sulfate solution reacts extremely slowly with aluminum to precipitate metallic copper, so if you don't want to wait a week to reduce a copper sulfate solution, then just add baking soda to precipitate the insoluble copper carbonate, filter that off, and chuck the sodium sulfate solution. Now, being that blue fire is the most popular and sought-after effect in this hobby, I could not possibly cover everything that everyone has tried in one video. Experimentation is always encouraged, but remember to always research incompatibilities and keep batches small for safety if you do decide to try some old formulas or take a crack at designing one of your own. We're going to end this video with a few thoughts on blue fireworks and the role of subjectivity in pyrotechnics. Blue is one of the most notorious colors for a reason, and that reason is that many people are so blown away by the vibrant greens and reds that can be produced easily that they expect the same from blue, and then feel a little bit slighted when blue stars aren't quite as bright or vibrant as the other colors are. 
But this is not true of everyone, and for every pyro that's completely obsessed with blue, there's another one who thinks we're wasting our time. Some people are perfectly content with lighter or purplish blues, and a lot of people stress that in the air, a lot of the classic and simple blue formulas look just fine. I'm always demonstrating loose powders on a spoon, but compositions do look different when formed into stars and shot in the air, so these videos are not a perfect representation of what you can expect in actual fireworks. The thing to remember with fireworks is that whatever you personally think looks good is what you should use, because my ideal blue is probably not your ideal blue, and vice versa. So that's going to do it for copper, and although I'd like to talk about a few other elements eventually, the next video is actually going to be on something a little more spicy. I don't want to give away too much, but I will tell you that I was unable to find any videos on YouTube on this particular topic, and you've likely never seen it before, so please consider subscribing if you're enjoying these videos. As always, thanks for watching, good luck, stay green.